What would occur if Venus and Mars changed orbits? I don't know about you, but if I were God, I'd like to think that I would enjoy using some of eternity to experiment with the things that I just made. I would be there constantly, obviously without injuring anyone, trying to remove objects of curiosity like, what if I placed the tiger in Africa and the lion in India? The white bear could go to Antarctica, and the penguins could go to Greenland. No, hold on, I almost changed Pi's value. What if, instead, I varied the strength of gravity according to the cube of distance? Well, I'm not sure. Well, you get the idea, I suppose. The game is one of what if. And sooner or later, I'm confident, I would have begun experimenting with the planets in the solar system as well, continuously blending their qualities to produce constantly shifting planetary settings. Which would you suggest I start with? I suppose I would have wondered what would happen if Mars and Venus traded orbits because I have always found the fates of Venus and Mars to be so fascinating. What would happen, yes. Would we have two better worlds, in your opinion? Is it worse? Mars and Venus are two planets that are located one on either side of our solar system's habitable region. Our Earth developed within the belt, and as a result, we are fortunate to live on a beautiful planet, but our two neighbors just missed it. As a result, Mars is currently too chilly while Venus is too hot. What would happen if Mars and Venus traded places? Is the question that our game, or rather, our thought experiment, is trying to answer. Could they become habitable Earth-like planets by properly combining their other properties, size, mass, more or less dense atmosphere? It takes a complicated web of interactions between a planet, the system it is a part of, and the star it orbits for a planet to be habitable or to be able to support life. According to the definition of a habitable planet, it can sustain life for an extended period of time. The habitable zone is the area around a star where liquid surface water can exist on a planet's surface. As far as experts are aware, this requires a planet to have liquid water. But what variables affect a planet's surface, atmosphere, and internal composition? It is difficult to say. The observable properties are the result of a combination of numerous processes, including physical, chemical, and geological ones. Mars is only one-tenth the mass of Earth and has a thin atmosphere that is constantly stripped away by the solar wind. Because Mars lacks a magnetic field that could divert the flow of high-energy particles, these particles are free to attack and disperse into space even the few gaseous molecules that are still present. The outcome? Temperatures on the surface of Mars have stabilized at an average of minus 60 degrees Celsius minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, far lower than they would be if the red planet were a little bit more massive and therefore supplied with an atmosphere. The fact that Mars orbits close to the upper edge of the conventional habitable zone, some claim it is even inside it, albeit by a little margin, means that the small planet cannot alter its temperature to levels that should be able to compete with it at that distance. Venus, in contrast to Mars, is almost as massive as Earth. But the atmosphere surrounding the planet is incredibly thick and primarily made of carbon dioxide. Unlike Mars, Venus has a gaseous atmosphere that is so opaque to infrared light that it creates a greenhouse effect that can increase average surface temperatures to a hellish 460 degrees Celsius 860 degrees Fahrenheit, temperatures hot enough to melt lead. Before we go on, just a quick, please subscribe to our channel. By pressing the bell, you may assist us in producing goods of ever higher quality. Two planets appear to be at their antipodes. What if Mars suddenly found itself orbiting the Sun at Venus's distance? Since there would be no atmosphere to produce the greenhouse effect, it has been estimated that the average temperature would only increase to about 90 degrees Fahrenheit 32 degrees Celsius, which would be comparable to the very pleasant temperatures in our tropics. However, it is clear that by increasing the average distance from the sun from 228 to 108 million kilometers, the amount of sunlight reaching its surface would increase by almost four times. 
However, since we are discussing average temperatures, Mars' incredibly thin atmosphere also poses a challenge. In fact, it has been determined that such a thin atmosphere would prevent incoming heat from dispersing effectively across the planet. Extreme weather patterns and significant temperature changes between day and night might result from this. Until recently, it was also believed that such a noticeable rise in temperature would cause the polar ice caps to melt, releasing enormous amounts of carbon dioxide gas as a result, and amounts that would make the planet's atmosphere much denser. While some models claim that the melting of the polar ice caps would increase atmospheric pressure by about 15 millibars, bringing it to a total of about 25 millibars, current study reveals that there is not enough carbon dioxide in the ice to produce a real atmosphere on Mars. It is important to keep in mind that Earth's average pressure at sea level is 1,000 millibars at this point. The carbon dioxide that is locked up in Martian rocks would also need to be taken into account, but doing so would need temperatures of at least 300 degrees Celsius, which thankfully Mars can't reach after it enters the orbit of Venus. There is still more. Mars would not only not benefit from the increase in warmth, but it would also lose its already scant atmosphere far more quickly than it did before. In fact, even at 108 million kilometers from the sun, the solar wind's pressure would be nearly four times stronger than what the planet would have felt in its initial orbit. So that in a short period of time, a few tens of thousands of years, Mars would become a barren, rocky planet that was utterly devoid of gases, ice caps, and water. What would happen if Venus were dragged outward into Mars' present orbit, even if Mars seemed to be performing no better in Venus' position? Would this Earth-sized planet be able to cool down and turn into a habitable second world if brought to the upper boundary of the habitable zone? Unexpectedly, cooling Venus might not be so easy. In fact, Venus has an extremely high albedo, which means that the top layer of its surrounding whitish clouds reflects around 75% of the radiation it encounters back into space, Earth, by comparison, reflects 30%. Thus, the scorching temperatures on the surface of the planet are primarily caused by the greenhouse effect, which is brought on by the atmosphere's thickness and density, rather than only the heat from the sun. Therefore, if Venus were to orbit at the distance of Mars, the lower amount of incoming light might not have an immediate impact on the planet's conditions. The temperature of Venus should theoretically be able to dip as low as 70 degrees Celsius 156 degrees Fahrenheit, but given what we have just mentioned, it is much more likely that it will not be able to do so for a very long time. For carbon dioxide to condense and stop enhancing the greenhouse effect, this must be below a certain level. According to computer calculations, Venus could only experience significant cooling if it were moved at least 260 million kilometers away from the Sun. In conclusion, it appears that just switching Mars and Venus orbits would not result in the creation of at least a second livable world. In reality, there are additional elements that, no matter how far from the Sun we place Venus and Mars, would prohibit them from becoming livable. The first, and most significant for Mars, is the absence of a magnetosphere, which is required to stop the solar wind from penetrating the planet's surface and dispersing its gaseous components. And we have already talked about this. The second relates to both Venus and Mars. Both, in fact, lack the remarkable geological phenomenon known as plate tectonics here on Earth. One of the most significant theories developed in the last century is plate tectonics, also known as continental drift. It explains how the lithosphere, which is made up of the Earth's crust and the upper part of the mantle, which is rigid while the lower part is plastic, is made up of enormous solid plates that float on the planet's molten interior and move slowly before colliding with one another. Earthquakes and the creation of the majority of the planet's volcanoes and mountain ranges are caused by these motions. Only our planet, among those we are aware of, has active tectonics right now. But earthquakes and volcanic eruptions are only one aspect of plate tectonics. More and more recent research points to the possibility that Earth's other distinctive feature, life, may depend on the movements of the planet's outermost region. 
In fact, tectonic activity is crucial for preserving the Earth's thermostat's long-term stability. Just think of carbon dioxide. A planet with too much carbon dioxide may end up turning into a planetary blast furnace, similar to Venus. In contrast, plate activity has contributed to maintaining Earth's thermal and environmental stability for billions of years by controlling the amount of carbon dioxide present. We have already stated that the Earth is blessed in a special way, but where does this wonderful natural gift come from? Up until this point, scientists had assumed that the Earth's mental's convection currents would be the cause of plate motion. However, during the past few years, an increasing number of planetary scientists have suggested that the existence of a sizable natural satellite, like as the moon, is what is actually driving this process. This could only indicate one thing, changing the distance from the sun component is insufficient to modify one's planetary environment. It appears that Mars and Venus will never be able to activate their magnetic fields and control their surface temperatures without the presence of a huge moon that can start the crust-crushing process. Can we take any action? Well, most certainly not. Although some people think it's possible that, in the distant future, it may be possible to adjust the orbital velocity of other planets at will, it would be a near impossibility to give them a satellite as huge as our moon. What do you guys think? Alright everyone this is it, see you in the next video.